Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Isaac Gilmore of Treat California and our esteemed panel. Thank you everyone for joining us. It's, uh, it's always an honor to bring this space to Concordia. So thank you again to Matt Swift and the whole team. This is our second iteration of this after uh, the annual summit last September. It's, uh, it's very interesting to bring, you know, essentially an emerging market to a space that is usually very traditional. And we wanted this panel to kind of showcase little nodes of the ecosystem within the US to the Latin American crowd. As, uh, as demand for a lot of these medicine grows, there's going to be potential impact in different Latin American countries, um, specifically the uh, Amazon River Basin. And so we wanted just a snapshot of what's going on up here. And we have uh, panelists representing you know, different aspects of the industry. We have Alex who runs a retreat that he'll go into in Costa Rica, an opportunity to go experience the medicines. We have Sherry who runs an insurance company that's pioneering in the space. And we have Jeremy who is running one of the uh, best VCs in the space that's really opening up the funnel and the opportunity for more companies to come in. So please, Alex, introduce yourself and you know, share a little bit. Awesome, Th uh, thanks, Isaac. Uh, great to be here. Um, Alex Enchin from Toronto, Canada, one of the founders of a company called Holos. We build and operate experiential re retreats or resorts um, that are really focused on working with psychedelic medicine uh, in a medically supervised way. Our first property is in the jungle of Costa Rica and um, it's holos.global and I can get more into it as we Get along. Thank you. And Sherry? Sherry Race, also from Toronto, Canada. Um, I'm the CEO of Enthia, and we are creating insurance plans so that people have safe and affordable access to psychedelic health care. Employers are very interested in this because they are seeing the cost of mental health on their workforce. Um, six out of ten employees have anxiety or depression. It turns into a lot of costs in productivity, absenteeism, turnover, and more importantly, psychedelic therapy, we're seeing the data, it works, but it's also extremely expensive to do a complete treatment. And so through Enthia, people have the chance to access these medicines without having to pay out of pocket. Thank you, I'm sir. Jeremy, and I am not from Toronto, Canada, <laughs> uh, uh, but I run Mystic Ventures, which is the leading uh, pre-seed and seed investor in the psychedelic medicine space. We take a very broad view of the landscape in that our fund's thesis is the elevation of human consciousness, or all consciousness, and uh, uh, both of these founders are in our portfolio, and which is pretty indicative of the range of investments that we do make. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, and just for a little more background on myself, I've been friends with Matt Swift from Concordia for about 12 years, and he was kind enough and um, forward thinking enough to bring this space and allow me to do it. But I'm also the chief of staff for Treat California, which is a citizens driven ballot initiative um, modeled after initiatives that can be done in 26 states and have been done twice, once in Texas and once in California for other markets. But what it allows to do is to create a $5 billion state funding agency that can be a watershed moment in the entire psychedelic space. Now this isn't to decriminalize, this is to provide resources for research, for clinical trials, so there's information data available to other states and to the federal government so we can evaluate rescheduling these drugs. Um, I'm gonna ask the other panelists for you know, their ideas of what the challenges are, but the biggest issue is that these drugs are still Schedule One, and the definition of a Schedule One drug is no, therape no therapeutic indication and high likelihood of addiction, which you know, cigarettes and alcohol qualify for, uh, none of the psychedelics do. And so, but just because they're probably, in my opinion, um, erroneously categorized that way, you still have to approach them properly if you want to reschedule them. And that means data, that means research, that means clinical trials. So that's the endeavor for my organization in California and to have an impact on the market um, at large. Uh, moving forward, I really want to know from each of you both what you see as the largest challenges outside of what I discussed, as well as what you need most for your you know, little uh, niche of the industry. So, Sherry, would you like to go? Yeah, so for Enthia, one of the largest challenges is uh, breaking down stigma. Uh, similar to what you discussed, there is still after effects of the war on drugs. 
There is still a stigmatization of mental health in general. There are still people who are afraid to talk about their own struggles and their own journeys and therefore afraid to talk to their families, their coworkers, and their bosses about their struggles. And that means they're not getting the help or treatment that they need. So that's one of the biggest challenges. Another challenge specifically around psychedelic medicine is an even further taboo where people are afraid of the effects of psychedelics without even looking into all of the data and the evidence that shows how beneficial they can be. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sherry. Jeremy, you want to take a crack looking at the whole thing? Yeah, industry? I mean, I, I, I think the biggest uh, barrier right now is the scheduling because that schedule one where, you know, mushrooms, uh, you know, LSD, MDMA are all schedule one, same as crack cocaine and heroin, you can't uh, get government funding for research. And, and, and that's deeply problematic. I recently moved to Puerto Rico and we're actually looking into rescheduling at the territory level for, strictly for research purposes. So there can be a jurisdiction in the United States where research can be done on these compounds because without having a pathway for research, it just makes everything exceedingly difficult uh, from a funding perspective. Uh, but the FDA has really shown uh, uh, amenability to, uh, to, to a lot approving uh, the phase one, two, and three trials. I think MDMA is going to get rescheduled this year. And so we're making progress, uh, but it couldn't happen fast enough because uh, I think the mental health crisis in this country and globally is one of the most pressing issues in society. Could not agree more. Alex? Yeah, I mean, you know, Prince Harry has come out recently talking about his, his use of, of psychedelic drugs in a therapeutic context. Aaron Rodgers, the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers, has talked about um, specifically ayahuasca and how it's really helped him in his life. And I sort of bifurcate this field into like the medical, which is more of Sherry's focus. What we do is really more around well-being and the betterment of well people. If I had to explain what we do in like a few words, it's sort of Canyon Ranch of psychedelic medicine in nature. Um, and you know, in, in the last couple months, we've had our first couple YPO forums book retreats with us. So I, my answer to that is we really need leaders like a lot of the people in this room and at this conference, people in the business world and government, especially the US government, to have experiences with these medicines and see that not only can they help people really struggling with PTSD and other mental health indications, but for people like I think almost everyone in this room and certainly everyone on this stage, they can really help improve people's lives and make people who are well even more well and, and high functioning. Absolutely. And that's a really good point that Alex makes is, you know, we have the acute issues, depression, PTSD, anxiety, and then there's just a kind of general malaise we have in, the, in our population, specifically in the West, where we're kind of disconnected, obviously, through our technology that we've created but it doesn't always sync with our biology. And we're looking for purpose and community and psychedelic medicine has the ability to help create that. And once you go from the acute to the general malaise, these medicines can go towards optimization. So, okay, I'm better, I feel healthy. I wanna move beyond this equilibrium to actually optimize and be the actual you know, best person I can be. Um, the other piece I'd like to discuss with regard to the resorts, um, both Alex's and many others is, so I'm a former Navy SEAL. And our community, when I say our community, I mean special operations. We're very much at the forefront of pushing this because we've accepted that we are broken from, from combat. And that usually is subsequent to you know, traumatic issues from childhood. And I've done a ton of my own work. I've hit absolute rock bottom before bringing myself back through psychedelics and to be on this stage. And resorts like Alex's are working with the different veteran organizations to provide these therapy um, outlets and I just came from DC two days ago, and we were sitting in hearings, and my friend Jesse Gould, who runs um, Heroic Hearts, he laid it out pretty cleanly. He's like, who am I? Why am I doing this? Why am I the person raising capital? Why are my friends and I sneaking out of our country to foreign countries to heal ourselves? When what we're getting from the VA is causing us to commit suicide. I have a friend in the SEAL teams that his suicide note was, study my brain so this doesn't happen to anybody else and we are currently sneaking out of our country, being funded by benevolent organizations to heal ourselves. Our nation's greatest warriors have to leave their own soil. That is unequivocally unacceptable. 
I mean, if there's any reason whatsoever to really evaluate the scheduling, to put resources into the data, that's the reason right there. You know, the, the character of a nation is how it treats its warriors, how it treats its veterans, and we are failing at that miserably right now. Well, a big issue here is the fact that in the past 100, 150 years, we have changed our conception of what medicine is. For all of human history, medicine was something that we took to feel better. Yep. It didn't matter if you were sick or not. Now we have this really messed up idea of a healthy, normal individual. We're all traumatized. We all can heal. We can all be better. And this is what makes what both Alex and Sherry are, are doing. It's so important because people should be able to have access to these medicines, not just because they're sick, not just because they have an indication that the FDA requires for you to get a drug approved, but because you want to be your most optimal set. Absolutely. And so having access to these tools, which is what they are, they're not silver bullets, will radically alter the course of humanity if people can focus on being the best versions of themselves, not just dampening themselves with Band-Aids that Big Pharma throws them in the form of pills. Perfect, Jeremy. I couldn't agree more. And really quickly before you jump in, Alex, that, that note he said about being a silver bullet, these medicines aren't six-minute abs. They don't just fix you. They need to be done in conjunction with therapy. And it needs to be structured because these medicines have the ability to, to change your biochemistry and how you relate to your external environment and how you relate to your own thoughts and emotions and how you're you release different hormones. So it, it has to be done with structure, with awareness, and with understanding. Sorry, Alex, please. I just wanted to say two quick things. One is, for anyone that's in the room who's um, looking to get more educated on this, I mean, uh, Netflix has a great four-episode um, series called How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, who's a very esteemed author. Also uh, a great book. Also a great book. Mm -hmm. yeah. Netflix is more digestible and <laughs> faster. Um, and I, I don't know if everyone is aware of this, but the state of Oregon um, legalized psilocybin, which is mushrooms, uh, in a therapeutic context um, two years ago. And it just went into effect. People, uh, clinics and centers are just starting to get licensed literally as we speak. And one of the beautiful things about that legislation is that you don't actually need a, a clinical indication or a diagnosis to, to seek treatment. You could go for spiritual reasons or well-being. And Colorado in November just actually legalized several plant-based psychedelic medicines, which will come into effect in, in about two years. So this is like a huge tidal wave that's coming around mental health and well-being and um, just like an amazing thing for, for all of us on the inside to get to watch as you know, major US states mm -hmm. you know, create legislation and regulation around this. Absolutely, and you know, going back to the information side, a lot of people just aren't aware of the complexity, the diversity, even the advancements in the space. Our, our nations and actually globally, our best institutions are researching this, but the disconnect because of the scheduling is making it very hard for them to do this and receive funding. But everything from the Imperial College of London to Hopkins to NYU, Columbia, um, University of South Florida, um, UC Berkeley, they're all doing work here, but they need help. Stanford as well. And so um, a great resource is if you go to microdose.buzz, that is probably one of the best aggregations of information in the psychedelic space. And that is an organization that came together with Concordia last year to um, be able to put this industry in front of an audience that is probably generally unaware of where it is at this time. Um, I definitely want to turn it over to Cherry because it's, and Thea is really the first insurance company that's found a way to start reimbursing for therapies. And that's been one of the biggest issues and a lot of what they're creating, we're gonna use as models for what we do in California once we pass uh, the Treat Initiative and Create Chime. And I really want to hear from you like what people can do within their the organizations, you have business leaders here, you have governmental leaders to get more involved to help expand your, the footprint you've created. Yeah, thank you. So the first thing is um, educate yourselves. That Netflix documentary or the book by Michael Pollan uh, is a great start. There are tons of resources on the Microdose website as well. The second thing is really start talking to the people you know. And I mean on a human one-to-one -one level, uh, one in two people at some point in their life are gonna experience some sort of mental illness. One in two. And if you extend that to everyone who's experiencing a mental illness is then in turn affecting the people that they love and care about, it probably affects everyone in this room right now. So my big ask is to check in with the people that you know and ask them how they're doing and have those more difficult conversations so that collectively we start talking about our emotions and our mental health 
with each other. Um, so it starts there. Then if you know of a company or in a position to make a decision for a company, you can check out what Anthea is doing. We, all over the US, we're offering psychedelic assisted therapy as a workplace benefit. So companies can offer this to their employees no matter the size. Also in Oregon we and Colorado, we are looking into offering psilocybin as a workplace benefit. Um, so there's lots of interesting things going on, but really it's about checking in with each other on a human level. Yep, I could not agree more. I mean, so many people, and this is just pre, you know, preceding psychedelics or even therapy, they just feel helpless. We have that problem in our, in our nation right now. And just that one phone call, that one little conversation, hey, how are you doing, can make all the difference and get, pers get a person to the step of looking at therapy, to then maybe going to psychedelics. Um, the, the ecosystem doesn't work without financing. And there's plenty in the psychedelic community, and it happens with any community where there ends up being a pull and tug between industry and wellness, and it has to be looked at from an inclusive manner. There has to be an economy behind it um, for the people, for it to A, to flourish, and for every aspect of it to be really valued from um, a political perspective. But one of the things I would caution against, and I've worked in the cannabis industry as well, is if you're looking at emerging markets that are very nuanced um, from an investment standpoint, not to go after and evaluate individual companies. So I'd very much like you, Jeremy, to discuss what it looks like from people that want to invest in the space and bring resources going into funds and different funds and your different um, theories around investment evaluations. Yeah, I mean, this is a very uncertain uh, macroeconomic environment. You've got, you know, inflation, uh, meaningful inflation for the first time in a long time, and, and, and most m m venture capitalists I know don't really know what to make of it all. Uh, the biotechnology sector has been hit particularly hard uh, because it is more speculative than many other sectors, and thus psychedelics has been hit even harder. So from a, a public stock perspective, it, 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 there's actually a lot of appealing deals right now. In fact, we're looking into raising another fund that allows us to do more private equity type investments because of all these companies that went public in this space. But there are also a lot of fabulous private companies. Uh, I think the valuations are coming down to earth. Uh, everything got a bit bloated a, a few years ago. Uh, but, but there are, you know, a handful of funds beyond mine. I mean, it's so easy to invest in a venture fund now. These days as an accredited investor, mm -hmm. the barriers to entry are incredibly low. Um, we use AngelList. We have a rolling fund uh, model. And it is so easy to just like get onboarded and subscribe as an LP with a fairly low minimum commitment. And so getting exposure to this space either in the public or uh, private markets, um, it, it, there's never been a better time to uh, invest in frontier technology just because of how institutional investing has evolved in the past several years. Yep. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think one of the things to, to wrap this up, and it's appropriate coming after the, the previous panel, is this is not a partisan issue. This is probably one of the best opportunities we've had in a long time, if ever, to truly be bipartisan in our decision making and our support. You know, this affects everybody, it doesn't matter age, race, ethnicity, what side of the aisle you sit on. I mean, typically you would say the left has been keeping this afloat for a very long time. When you talk to my deep, you know, deep, deep South Republican friends, they don't want their Navy SEALs or Green Berets sneaking across the country. They don't want their kids to grow up with malaise and nothing that can help them. So we have an opportunity here to bridge a lot of wounds that have been taking place over the last 10 years through healing everybody and healing our warriors. And we have an opportunity not just to bridge policy, but to bridge just the discord between people. You know, every religion's goal is to find that equilibrium within yourself. And that's why we always stress that this is not a quick fix. This is therapy with the tool to bring it across the finish line so that people are more balanced within themselves and can then approach the world in a better way. Um, I'll leave it with that, and please, Alex. Yeah, I would, I would just close by saying, I, I think for a lot of people when they hear about things like you know, magic mushrooms or LSD or MDMA, it brings up a lot of stuff, and I would really encourage everyone here to look at the data and look at that you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, whether you're a vet or somebody who's been through you know, a horrific incident. There was no cure for PTSD, and in clinical trials, which are you know, close to FDA approval, 
two thirds of people going through this MAPS, which is a nonprofit's protocol with several MDMA treatments, 67% of people going through that protocol no longer qualify for PTSD. So like this really works. It does work. Well, all three of you, thank you very much for the work you're doing and for taking the time to speak today. Thanks. And uh, we're gonna wrap it up there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.